Good morning. Good morning. Um, quoting the Apostle Paul, um, the Catholic writer and theologian and spiritual leader, uh, Richard Rohr, reminds us, when everything is reconciled in Christ, God will be all in all. There is only Christ. He is everything and is in everything. All fullness is found in Christ, and through Christ, all things are reconciled, everything in heaven and everything on earth. This is the cosmic Christ, Roar writes, who always was, who became incarnate in time, and who is still being revealed. If you'd like an abridged bumper sticker version of that, um, John Wesley was fond of always saying, the best of all is, God is with us. The best of all is, God is with us. Among other things, the resurrection, we, we're still in the season of Easter, leading us up to the season, the, the day of Pentecost. But in this season of Easter, we're reminded that the resurrection means, Easter means, that Christ is with us always and everywhere, in all time and all space, filling all of creation, which is why Jesus will say to his friends, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Because in all times and in all places, in all circumstances, in joy and in sorrow, in life and in death, God is with us. Christ is with us. The very presence and power of God to bring joy and hope and healing into all circumstances of life. God near to us as our very breath. That said, we inhabit uh, a world that can at times be frightening. And we are at times a frightened people. Jesus knew that, which is why I think he offered these words of comfort to and assurance to his disciples, senseless violence, uh, coronavirus, ups and downs of the economy, um, instability and war in Europe. We're afraid of the stranger who maybe steps on the elevator a little too close or walks behind us on the street a little too close for comfort of the diagnosis or illness or whatever it might be that, that could potentially one day show up at our door. Afraid of those who are different, who don't talk like us, don't look like us. Afraid that if you live the life God has called you to live, you might have to give up too much. Or that the world will ridicule you as some kind of religious fanatic. Afraid that no matter how much we earn or save or invest, there will never be enough. Afraid that you'll never be truly happy, fulfilled. Afraid of the future, maybe. Afraid of leaving home, of going off to college or changing jobs, leaving behind the things that are familiar and comfortable, routines, better to keep life, life uh, manageable, predictable. Fear grips us. It paralyzes and robs us of life. Over the years, I've, I've known many church members who've experienced the loss of something or someone they love, and now they are gripped by fear, wondering what's next. One loss leading to another loss. Trauma on top of trauma. For some, fear becomes overwhelming and paralyzing, occupying all the imaginations of the heart, shrinking our capacity to love and to be faithful, to be free and to live life with joy. Now, our brains, of course, are, um, are wired to keep us alive. That's a good thing. So not all fear is, is bad. Say the sense of uneasiness when you're on the top of a tall building or walking, uh, hiking in the mountains, you get a little close to the edge. That feeling in your stomach, that's to keep you safe, secure. Or the fear you experience when someone is driving just a little too 
fast for comfort. The fear that lets you know I probably shouldn't get in the car with that stranger. Diligence, awareness, a a, a sense of our surroundings, being careful in dangerous settings, fight or flight. These are all, all, they, they all originate from a healthy sense of fear. From a desire to be safe and well. A proper sense of fear has its place. But this morning, I'm thinking about the kind of fear that keeps us from living life. The kind of fear that is an obstacle to the abundant, God-sized life God has for each of us. 1975, Roger Hart conducted a study that focused on where children were allowed to play. He looked at 86 children between the ages of 3 and 12 in a small Vermont town. And he followed the kids throughout their day, documenting everywhere the children went. He then took that information and he made a physical map of where children were allowed to play. And he measured the distance each child was allowed to travel by him or herself. And Hart discovered that these kids had remarkable freedom. Even four- or five-year-olds traveled unsupervised throughout their neighborhoods, and by the time they were 10, 11 or so, they really had free range of the entire town, quite often parents not even knowing where they were. And the parents didn't seem worried or concerned about it. Just a few years ago, he went back to this same little Vermont town to document the children of the children that he had studied in the early 70s. And when he asked the new generation of kids to show them the, the, the map of where they were allowed to play alone by themselves, they basically walked hard around the edges, the perimeter of their property. And that was it. They just didn't have very far to take me, he said. In other words, the huge circles of freedom had grown very small. Hart concluded there was now no free range outdoors. Even when the kids are older, parents now say, I need to know where you are at all times. I've uttered those words. (laughs) Many of you have as well. Especially when they started driving were teenagers. (laughs) I knew that I didn't know where they were at all times, but I said it anyway. Right? What's odd about this is this little town in Vermont is no more dangerous today than it was in the early 70s. That's statistically provable. There is literally no more crime in this little town than there was in the early 70s. No more crime. uh, No more accidents. It's like the same place, essentially. So why, he asks, has the invisible leash between parent and child uh, grown so much shorter? And the reason was fear. When he interviewed the parents, um, they described their fear. And so the, the fear of the world outside the door had narrowed the circle of their lives. Fear narrows the circle of our lives. Now, listen, I'm not suggesting that you let your small children roam all over Davidson or Cornelius or Huntersville or wherever you happen to live. Um, Saying that we might have a problem with fear is not an invitation to be foolish or irresponsible. I'm just pointing out what I think John was trying to say to us in this morning's gospel reading. As followers of Jesus, our, our motivation for life Uh, for decision-making, for ministry as individual Christians and then as the church, has to come from someplace other than fear. Because as one author observed, fear is a poor chisel with which to carve out tomorrow. And so John points to Jesus, who promises to be with us always and whose presence invites us to move from fear to love. That is, as we come to love God perfectly with all of our heart and mind and body and soul, fear is is pushed aside and, and love takes over. 
And when love takes over, we become free to live, and the circle of our lives is enlarged. Recall from last Sunday, for disciples of Jesus, love is not some abstract idea. It has a name and a face and a voice. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is the love of God with skin on, the incarnation of God's love that we see and experience God's love firsthand in Christ. And in Christ, we can be at peace. Not that everything in life will be easy or all sunshine and roses or that we won't have hardships and difficulties and challenges, but we can live with a sense of well-being, a sense of peace, knowing that God is indeed with us. God's love is with and for us. Um, This is the life that we're created for. Not a life in which the, the circles of life are narrowed or constricted, but one in which the geography of our lives expands, is enlarged because of our faith and love for God. Being made in God's image means that God created us with the capacity to be like God, to to love like God, to be free like God. And loving like God means living a larger life, a more expansive life, including loving those that the world deems unworthy of our love and loving those that the world says it might be risky to love. And perhaps even those the world says we should fear. Jesus never promised to make us safe. He did, however, promise to set us free from our bondage to fear and death, to experience the abundant life for which our hearts long, and to live in peace. We see in Christ that love sets us free, and God's love is sacrificial, it's self-emptying, it never gives up, it cares more for the other than for self, doesn't force itself on others, doesn't demand that other people be like us before we can love them. It, it isn't me first. It doesn't keep score of sins or mistakes or missteps or shortcomings. It takes pleasure in the truth. God's love is tolerant and patient. It always looks for the best in the other. It assumes the best. It never looks back. And as Paul says, it never ends. It is a love that is wholeheartedly devoted toward God and others. So as Christ followers, we're not called to some kind of lukewarm sentimentality. That won't set us free. We're not called just to be nice. We're called to know and live in and through the love of God. And that love brings peace and sets us free. Because again... And I bet you all have experienced this. I hope not too much, but fear narrows the circle of our lives. It constricts and it can literally choke the life out of us as individuals and as church. Jesus, however, was always about widening the circle, inviting others in, always about increasing the size of our lives. In many ways, I think the decline that we see as in the church in the United States, it is in part, I think, related to both our unwillingness to love and our allowing our life as church to be motivated by fear. When I was a district superintendent, I heard it all the time. Fear of decline, fear that resources would be scarce, fear that strangers or new people might change us, Fear that traditions would go away, fear of the unknown, fear that keeps us planted in the past rather than moving into the future that God is calling us to. And a church motivated by fear is powerless to change the world. But Christ comes to his church with words of assurance. Resurrection is Christ saying to us, I'm here, I'm with you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Now, I know that it's in some ways easy for me to say that on a Sunday morning in a sermon, and it is sometimes much, much harder to live it. 
There are certainly things in this world that are frightening, terrifying. Some among us are facing issues and decisions and challenges that are beyond our control and that literally scare you to death. And I pray that you can hear today Jesus saying to you, don't let your heart be troubled. Be at peace. I'm with you. And I pray our broken world can be gripped by love as well, that kind of love. Because a world motivated by fear, you all know this, history demonstrates that does not go well. And even more concerning for me is if in this broken, often fearful world, if we as church fail to bear witness to the love of God because we're too occupied, preoccupied, by the fear mongers and what they're telling us than we are with Christ who is whispering to us day after day, I'm with you, don't be afraid, all will be well. God longs for a people who are no longer servants to fear, uh, slaves to fear, but are servants of love. And who never forget that when we were very unlovable and unworthy, God was willing to take a risk to be pushed out of the world and onto the cross to love us. And friends, that kind of love casts out fear and can literally save the world. Some of you are familiar with this. Writing in, um, during the Hundred Years' War, just imagine for a moment, she lived during the Hundred Years' War her whole lifetime. Uh, The plague, um, economic just catastrophe, the world was had to feel like it was coming undone, literally, every day. Terrifying. Uh, Julian of Norwich, uh, filled with the confidence uh, um, of God's presence with her, that Easter, that resurrection means that Christ is everywhere, at all times, and in all places, all circumstances, that we're never apart from God's love. She says this, all shall be well. And all shall be well. And in case we weren't listening, and all manner of things shall be well. All shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Do not let your hearts be troubled, do not let them be afraid. Love has come to us scattering the darkness like the light. Walk in the light of God's love. Friends, walk in the light of God's love and watch the circle of your life grow. Amen.